Hi, this is Charlie Matatuyela from Blue Bear Flutes. Of course, you can find us on BlueBearFlutes.com as well as uh, Facebook, Blue Bear Flutes, and Blue Bear Flutes on Instagram, probably Twitter, although we haven't kept up with it in a while. Uh, anyway, all over the web. And today, the flute making video I wanted to bring you guys, which we've been making a lot of really interesting videos here lately, um, but uh, I wanted to make another video on how to make a type of flute that we have made in the past, and that is our Cherokee Four Hole Whistle. Now, some of you probably have seen our four hole whistles on our website and know that we make them out of either river cane or sawgrass, but for convenience sake and so that anyone can make one, I wanted to show you how to make one out of PVC. I'm not really into making flutes out of PVC. There's so many other good flute makers out there that, that uh, focus on it, and some of them make some really astounding PVC flutes that sound amazing. Uh, I'm tickled to death with my little four hole whistle here, though, and I think you will probably see why. So it's a neat instrument and it only has four holes there. The uh, sound hole is also just a round hole up here which is kind of nice and it has a small plug inside of it. I'm about to give you the measurements so if you've got pen and paper or want to stop the video or what have you and go grab something so you can write it down that's great. Um, but honestly it's very simple to do and I'll never forget what my, uh, my granddad told me when I asked him where should the fingerings go. Uh, his answer was pretty much just put them where you think they need to be and uh, I thought that was pretty cool. Anyway, so uh, the first thing we're going to do is talk about the material I use. This is actually a piece of hot water PVC. You can tell because it's a little different color than the standard uh, PVC. It is a one half inch piece, uh, so that inside diameter is just about a half of an inch, um, and uh, the tubing itself is relatively safe as far as I know for just about anything. So one half inch in diameter. Uh, the piece I got was 10 feet long, but of course you only need seven inches to make this happen. So we're going to mark our piece of PVC here at about seven inches. Let's see. Right there. Mine is actually seven and an eighth, which I just kind of like a little bit longer mouthpiece. So if you want your mouthpiece a little longer, you can consider that, but I measure all my measurements from the top here, so um, you'll have to kind of backtrack and add some of that in. But anyway, a uh, 7-inch mouthpiece is kind of, or excuse me, a 7-inch flute is about the same size as most of the, the four-hole whistles that we make, so that works out pretty good. The uh, piece of dowel that we're going to use for the plug here is supposed to be a half-inch. Usually dowels are relatively the right size, and, and this dowel is probably the reason I feel like the inside diameter of my PVC is not a half inch, but um, the uh, dowel itself is just a little fat, and that could be from moisture because the dowels swell up as they get moist. If you dry it out, they shrink, so um, there's some benefit there if you think about it. But uh, we're going to cut this at a slant here in just a few minutes. I'll show you exactly what to do because that, that's the part that most people get really confused on. It's, it's quite easy, but of course, one of the most important parts of making a, a whistle or flute with a plug inside of it is how that plug functions and what it does. So we'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, something else I'm going to do before I go over there to, uh, to cut this is I'm going to go ahead and mark my holes and I'm going to use my flute for marking these holes. The reason that I do this is because I imagine back in the old days, and I say the old days, you got to think about before the Europeans came over here, most indigenous peoples did not keep tape measures in their pockets and although we did have measuring tools and devices uh, the convenience of having something like that may not have been something that everybody had so for this reason it is my belief I like to put my little disclaimer on it, my philosophy that the original people probably copied one when they made another one that's the way I've always done it that's the way a lot of the old-time flute makers that I've known um, have always made flutes. They didn't make it by schematics and measurements and some kind of JavaScript on some page in the middle of somewhere. Um, they, they actually copied one to the next. And some of you, since you don't have a copy of one of these on hand, it might benefit you for me to give you the measurements, which is why I'm going to do that. And 
like I said, we're going to make this entire piece seven inches. I think I can slide this over here where you can see it. And once again, like I said, mine is just about, it looks like it might be almost a quarter of an inch longer, between an eighth and a quarter, but honestly, the functionality of an extra eighth inch of mouthpiece is not really probably worth it. It's just the way that I did it myself. So first, your measurement of the length of the piece here is seven inches. From there, the sound hole from the seven inch mark from your mouthpiece, the sound hole is a half inch down. And then from there, we have three inches to the first fingering, three and 11 sixteenths to the next fingering, and four and 7 sixteenths to the next fingering. The last fingering, the fourth one here, is gonna be five inches and one eighth. So going back over those measurements, it's seven inches long, from the top of the flute to the sound hole is a half inch. Then it's three inches to the first fingering, three and 11 sixteenths, four and seven sixteenths, and then five and one eighth. And that'll put you in the ballpark of what you need to have to, uh, to make this thing play modestly, you know, and moderately correct. So uh, I think that uh, you'll be happy with that. From there, you can of course experiment like the original people did and come up with all different shapes, sizes, and, and anything you'd like to, uh, to make a four-hole flute. Um, but now we need to take our piece of PVC and dowel over to the saw and the drill, and you'll meet me over there. Now, first off, I'd like to tell you that, of course, you can cut this with a small hand saw. There's no reason you shouldn't do that. Um, I have the convenience of a scroll saw. That's why I'm going to use it. And it's pretty quick, so that, that helps out a little bit. We'll worry about these burrs and stuff here in just a minute. Now, uh, for the plug, since I'm at the scroll, scroll saw here, I'm gonna go ahead and cut this. Um, there's kind of a trick to it. If you'll watch what I'm doing, I'll explain it and it'll give you kind of an idea. Okay. So what I just did was I cut a diagonal in the middle of this plug. Now, of course, the diagonal is over a certain period, which is about an inch. Maybe an inch and an eighth would be the maximum. But the diagonal is from one end to the other relatively straight, something, once again, you can do with a small handsaw. So the angle is somewhat critical. Um, that you cut it at, but not as great and important as the escape um, area, which I'm going to show you on my sander in just a moment. The escape is actually what you know we need to focus on here. So if you make your diagonal a little longer than an inch, if it's two inches and it's just a real long gradual slant, that's okay. That's not a problem. Um, with the diameter of the dowel, you're always going to come to a point where the slant is going to meet a, uh, a tip up here that is going to be where the air escape is and it's always going to come to a point down here where it's either too weak for it to um, you know hold itself together or it's just too abrupt that um, it's not easy enough to push inside of the inside of the PVC so don't worry about this part so much uh, just as long as you get it about an inch long um, right there at that that nice uh, half of a diagonal, you know, half of the the um, inside width of the diameter of the dowel. Uh, if you do that, I think you're going to be in good shape. So let's go over here to the drill press and drill out the holes, and then I'll take it over to the belt sander and show you what I meant about this plug and what we need to do here. Okay, so this is a 3 16th standard drill bit here. There's no tip on the end of it. A lot of you that have watched me for the past several years on YouTube know that I really appreciate Brad Point drill bits, but this is just a standard point drill bit, and I'm going to go ahead and drill out these holes. One thing that I might add is that because this piece of PVC is round, it tends to want to roll whenever you push a drill into it. 
that. Some people make a little V-shaped jig that you can set up here. If you're making a bunch of these to help keep it from rolling. Now, if you don't have a belt sander, once again, you can do this with a piece of sandpaper just by hand. It's not that big of a task. And what I'm going to do on the sound hole here is not completely important either, but it's something I like to do because it helps to, to make the wall thinner at the sound hole, which makes a nice splitting edge for the air uh, to split on for it to make the sound. So, you know, of course, the cleaner you can make the sound, the better off you're going to be. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and sand the ends of this off real quick too. So I know it's a little bird, but I'm going to go back and sand this by hand and that'll all be gone. I would like to mention that though PVC is considered to be non-toxic, it is my opinion, and probably a, a fact if I were to look into it a little more in depth, but the dust off of PVC is probably not something you want to keep in your lungs. So my suggestion is to wear a face mask like I am right now um, if you do that. And honestly, doing this as much of this by hand or with something less than a, a belt sander would probably not be a bad idea. Uh, but no matter what, there's always going to be dust whether you are using a hand sander or sandpaper or the, the uh, belt sander here. But you really need to, uh, to consider your lungs and breathing and everything that you want to wear a face mask. So let me see. There are, of course, so many different ways to do this, too. I used to do this part here with a drill when I made them out of both river cane as well as PVC. So, uh, once again, the PVC ones I've never sold. It's always been something kind of fun to make and give away. Uh, and I've also experimented around with some flexible um, tubing that makes some wonderful uh, four-hole whistles out of. Not completely flexible, but, but moderately flexible. Uh, just a different type of, like, cold and hot water, like refrigeration tubing. Uh, works out pretty good but uh, but anyway as promised I will show you the part that's the most important here and that's getting the exit of this uh, plug correct and what you want to think about is and I know some of it's kind of gummed up there which I'll clean off back at the table but you want to think about the size of the hole here the size of your sound hole and how much air is going to exit out of this thing so let me sand it down a little bit and I'll show you what I mean Now, what I have done is I've created an exit, and I know that sounds kind of unusual, but basically if you have a half-inch diameter plug going into a half-inch diameter piece of PVC, you're going to stop the airflow. And anywhere that you allow a little bit of um, the diameter of the plug to diminish, you're going to have an air escape, which is what we've wanted to create here. So we've made an air escape, but the diameter of the plug being the size that it is and the width of the air escape considering the size of the hole I've made the air escape seem like it's going to be almost twice the size of the sound hole here and honestly once it's in the in the piece of PVC they're really going to be close to the same size which we'll get a good picture of that in just a minute but I think at this point I feel comfortable I know it's going to be a little tight but I think we can get this jammed up in there and we'll do best just to finish it over to work table Okay, so I went ahead and took the liberty of lightly sanding this little plug here by hand on some uh, 120 sandpaper.
just so that the little ramp is very smooth because the smoother the air passageway, of course, the easier the air travels and the better the sound. Um, as I mentioned, there is a way to get this scar tissue, this uh, burr out of the inside of this hole. If you're very careful, you can go in and just kind of lightly scrape it out with a hobby knife. And that usually, usually does a trick. Looks like Ronald decided to come up here and help me out a little bit. Hey, Ronald. Yeah, you're a good kitty. Ronald has helped me make a bunch of flutes. And let's see what we can do here. I believe that I can probably force this with a little bit of effort right in there. Is that how you do it, Ronald? Okay. Let's see. Now, I've pushed this plug in. It's a little tight, but I still see a nice air gap in there, and I'm going to show you that in just a second. Ronald, <laughs> but uh, let's see. Just want to make sure everything's lined up right. Let's see if it makes a sound. Yeah, not too bad. Um, honestly, that's probably where I want to leave it, but at this point, there's one other thing I really should do. Oh, didn't mean to scare you there, boy. Go ahead and sand these fingerings down. Thanks again for your help, Ron. Um, because this is cold water PVC, it's got some markings on it, and I usually sand those off. And, and the reason I sand them off, because you can actually get them off with acetone if you're careful. Once again, acetone actually will melt the PVC, uh, you know, eventually. But if you just lightly sand it like this, um, you can get those off, and it leaves a nice. Uh, unusually um, preferable, I don't know how to s describe this otherwise, an unusually preferable rough surface. <laughs> it makes it look a little bit more like wood on the outside, which is kind of neat. I know that um, I've talked to some other people that, that make PVC flutes and they uh, say that they usually do that because it gives it a kind of a unique look. Now I've actually gone as far as staining a few of these. Um, I've used different types of paint to try to you know, affect a color on them, but uh, honestly, with this color, uh, that it's not bright white, it's more of kind of a cream or a light beige color, I think it looks pretty good natural. They, uh, they make a really wonderful little instrument for any kind of groups like the Scouts or uh, anybody in 4-H that wants to learn a little bit about, you know, Native American musical instruments or how to play any instrument in general. One thing I should have mentioned in the beginning of this video is that you can play not only the, uh, the minor scale on these, you just cover all four holes and uncover them from the bottom and blow soft. And then you cover them all up and blow a little faster and that'll be the top note. And with this particular four hole whistle size, shape, and you know, the placement of the fingerings, you can actually play a few notes into the next part of the, the next octave. So I'll start on the top octave here. And then to play the next note, you want to uh, blow fast and partially cover the hole instead of fully uncovering uh, because it tends to want to go really sharp the higher you go. But you can also play a major scale on these things too, which is really cool. You'll start off with the tonic of the pentatonic scale. So you'll cover all but the bottom hole. Leave the bottom hole uncovered. And then uncover the next. And then cover it back up. Lift your next finger. Ronald, I don't think we need help this time. <laughs> but uh, anyway. Start off with your fingers covering all but the bottom hole. When you get up here, once again, it's, it's just alternating basically. You um, uncover a hole, then you uncover the next hole and cover that one back, and then you uncover the hole, and then you uncover the next one, covering that one back. Uh, always this third finger here, and then eventually you uncover all of them. So. So once again, you 
So I think I told you to uncover all of them, but you actually, you leave this one covered, then cover all holes, blow fast, uh, finger off, and then finger off uh, partially, and then that's the top of the note. So. We have a fingering guide for this on our website you can download, which will help out a lot in learning how to play this particular little instrument. But back to making, um, basically, when you push the plug into the top of the whistle here, you want the edge of the plug to be seen right there from the sound hole. You don't want it to be pushed too far in or too far back. Too far back is the biggest problem. Many of you, as you make these, you'll find that pushing it just a little further in may be the important thing uh, for you to make it play right and play a nice quality sound. But the one single most important thing is being able to see a a uh, little bit of light come through this hole here on this side of your plug as well as see some of the dark area uh, from the inside of the flute I can see underneath of the edge of the sound hole this you know the splitting edge as they call it so that part there it's going to take you a little practice but if you'd like to zoom in on it here and see if you can see what I'm talking about as far as light goes and the placement of that plug and the amount of airspace that you have and all that kind of stuff is somewhat important there. You get kind of an idea. And then I'll show you this other area here too. You can kind of see how far down you push, push the plug. So the plug's right at the edge there. And that really helps out. Now after you've gone this far, Honestly, it's not necessary, especially if you have one of those dowels that's a little bit too big and it just barely fits in there. But I like to seal this guy off with just a couple of drops of super glue. I swear we keep the super glue companies all in business. But uh, just seal it off. And of course, when you're doing that, if you roll it around a little bit, that's a good idea. You can see it covering the um, inside flute area of the plug. One thing you don't want to do is have a drop of super glue get inside of your air escape area here because if that happens, then of course you've got to find some way to clean it out. In the shop here we have countless ways to clean it out because we do that with, with uh, other whistles all the time, like our eagle whistles you see here. Um, there gets to be a little bit of super glue up in there, but if you, and I just put some in there, <laughs> you blow like that sometimes without putting your lips on it so that you don't get the super glue residue on there, um, a lot of times it'll just blow it right out. But you got to be very mindful if you use anything like super glue. Cyanocritic glue is, is uh, um, very, uh, I think it's, it's probably a lot more complex to use than, than any of us, including the manufacturer, can, can tell you. Just be careful not to get it in your eyes and your face. And uh, I don't like to have it on my lips or either. You know, I've got some on the tip of my finger right now from filling a flute earlier, filling a, a little part of it. Um, but, uh, but that's pretty much it. When this guy is done, we can actually either cut that plug off or sand it down and like I mentioned just a little bit of hand sanding and you have a really beautiful um, small whistle that you can play everything from popular folk music on to uh, you know modern music you can play the blues on it you can play any kind of minor pentatonic music uh, you can play any type of Native American flute music uh, as well as um, everything in a major scale. So, very interesting little whistle. I hope you guys have found this video helpful. Uh, I'd like to thank my camera person and also Ronald the cat for coming in and helping us out a little bit today. He's uh, usually anxious to get on camera. Today's his, his debut. So, anyway, um, I hope you've found some use in this. I hope you enjoy playing the flute that you make. If you're making these to give away, please keep in mind that very small children may not I uh, need to play something like that because I'll never forget the story my wife told me about her father when he was a baby walking around with a, uh, was it a drumstick in his mouth and, and he fell over and it punctured the back of his throat. So uh, be very careful. Be mindful of what you do. You know, not everything's made for everybody. They, there's time. You know, they'll find time. But uh, once again, a nice instrument that I think that uh, everyone will enjoy. And as mentioned, of course, historically in several books about uh, Cherokee Indians, historically, Honestly, most people's made this kind of flute. Uh, have seen them uh, all across our country. So, anyway, you guys take care. Come and visit us at bluebearflutes.com, uh, where you can find a Cherokee-made River Cane uh, four-hole whistle, 
and uh, also uh, find us on our Facebook page as well as Instagram where you'll find a lot of nice pictures of things that uh, I think that you might find amazing. So anyway, take care. Charlie Montatuyella signing out. Happy flute making and happy flute playing.